Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to the Chain Reaction Research event today. We appreciate everyone joining us for our discussion. I'm Matt Pietrasi with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR Consortium with Aid Environment and Profundo. For those of you not familiar with CR, we provide sustainability risk analysis for investors in high risk commodities. We will be discussing two of our reports today, both of which assess the upcoming EU deforestation law and its impacts on stakeholders within Brazilian cattle and soy su supply chains. Our presentation looks at traceability within these supply chains and how associated costs are not overly burdensome. We will also be discussing the deforestation footprint of Brazil's largest meat packers, JBS, Marfrig, and Minerva, and how they are not likely compliant with the EU law. In our discussion today, the audience will be on mute. If you have any questions, please add them to the Q&A function, and we will hopefully get to them during the Q&A after the, after the presentations. As you can see on this slide here, we have the, our, our list of presenters. And now I'll hand it over to the teams at Aid Environment and Profundo for, for the main presentation. So thank you, Matt, and hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Rita, and I'll be talking about the viability of the traceability requirements included in the upcoming EU deforestation regulation in Brazilian cattle and soy supply chains. Next slide, please. So the EU is a significant importer of cattle and soy products. In 2021, uh, EU countries imported 32 million metric tons of soy products, that of the products that will uh, most likely be covered by the regulation, worth of uh, 30.9 billion euros. Uh, oil cake and soybeans represent the largest share of soy imports by volume, which correspond to 52 and 42 uh, percent of these uh, total imports, respectively. Uh, and as for the cattle products, in 2021, the EU imported 739,000 metric tons of beef and leather products, uh, of those, again, that are expected to be covered by the regulation, in a total of 3.2 billion euros. Uh, in this case, fresh or chilled beef and tanned or crust hides and skins of cattle were the most imported products uh, of the mix by volume, representing 59% uh, and 63% of the total imports of beef and leather products, respectively. In the figure, we can see uh, then the most relevant countries of origin of the, these imported products. Uh, just to clarify, the countries in dark blue are, of course, the EU27 countries, and the countries in light blue are European, other European countries that are not part of the EU, but which are important suppliers of at least one of the products displayed in the pie charts below. Uh, this figure shows uh, that Brazil is an important supplier of these products. Uh, specifically, it was the largest EU supplier in 2021 of several of the soy, beef, and leather products that will be covered by the regulation. Again, those that are expected. Uh, and it is therefore a country where the impact of the upcoming EU deforestation regulation may likely be significant. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, regarding the traceability requirements and the feasibility of tracing soy products up to the plots of land of production, an aspect that is important to mention is that there are already zero deforestation agreements that include traceability. The Amazon Soy Moratorium already traces and monitors soy supply to the production site through satellite imagery and rural environmental registry records, which is data that is all publicly available. Uh, the Soft Commodity Forum, which brings together six of the largest soy traders operating in Brazil, uh, just to know ADM, Bungie, Cargill, Kofco, Louis Dreyfus, and Viterra, are also already tracing their soy supply originating from 61 priority municipalities in Cerrado up to the first point of aggregation, while having already made commitments to full traceability. 
And still on top of this, some of these larger large trader companies uh, in the sector, in the soy sector, uh, for instance, Bungi that I already referred, have, al have also already committed to share their traceability methodologies with partners in order to facilitate the implementation of traceability. So all of these aspects already lay much of the groundwork necessary to approach traceability in Brazilian soy supply chains providing a, a blueprint as well for that and indicating that it is possible to trace soy products to the production site. Nonetheless, uh, it is also clear that traceability is still a work in progress in this, uh, in the, in this uh, Brazilian soy supply chains. Uh, gaps remain, uh, and especially in what concerns tracing the indirect supply of soy. Uh, as you can see in the image here on the slide, the direct suppliers of traders that eventually place soy products in the market are not necessarily the producers uh, of the soy because there can be other links and intermediaries between them, like you can see here, these, these aggregators. So this means that traders don't always know the exact origin of their products. Thus, achieving full traceability will demand increased efforts geared towards indirect supply streams of soy. And besides this, tracing soy supply chains will also likely uh, expose and, 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 and show uh, more, in, more evidently problems which link soy production to deforestation. Uh, to start, uh, existing systems and data uh, need to be improved in order not to hamper traceability. Uh, this is particularly the case with the rural environmental um, records uh, from the, the registry. Uh, since these, these registrations are self-declared, uh, making this system vulnerable to fraud and irregularities. Um, then there are also uh, biome specific challenges that are likely to create extra hurdles to traceability. So for example, contrary to what happens in the Amazon region, soy farmers in Cerrado, where a significant part of the soy that reaches Europe is actually produced, have less incentives not to deforest since according to the Brazilian forest code, they are only required to leave 20 or 35% of the native vegetations in their properties intact as legal reserve. However, the EU regulation forbids both legal and illegal deforestation, which might lead soy farmers in Cerrado to be less inclined to adhere to traceability systems and forego the possibility of clearing like their lands. Next slide, please. As the one before. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as for traceability in cattle supply chains, we also see that there are opportunities and feasible options to expand traceability, covering the entire supply chain. Uh, existing systems and tools, specifically, again, the uh, environment, rural environmental registry and the animal transit guide declarations can be used to trace and monitor cattle-derived products even beyond direct suppliers, uh, which is something that has even been recognized and stated by the Brazilian Roundtable on Sustainable Livestock. Data from these declarations has been uh, already integrated into systems and tools such as Visipec and Silvird, which several operators and traders uh, are using to trace uh, the cattle products they purchase. In addition, big industry players such as JBS, Marfridge, and Minerva have the potential to create strong impact in the practices within the sector, and they have already made commitments to and are working towards full traceability of their cattle supply chains. Uh, similarly, and also very important, multi-stakeholder approaches also prove to be an important facilitator to increase traceability in cattle supply chains. Uh, some examples of this that are already in place are, for example, the conduct adjustment term, and the Indirect uh, Suppliers Working Group for Brazilian Ranchers, which are examples of multi-stakeholder agreements or multi-stakeholder multi forums, respectively, that have been contributing uh, to this uh, increment of the use of traceability uh, within cattle supply chains. Yet, and like in the case of soy, of course, 
uh, implementing traceability in Brazilian cattle supply chains is not a given, and there are challenges still to be addressed, which lie particularly with the wide network of indirect suppliers that is involved in these supply chains. So again, as you can see in the image on the slide, indirect suppliers can be involved in any of the different stages of the animal life cycle, and it is likely that animals have spent some of their lifetime in farms other than those that supply the slaughterhouses directly. So this complex architecture creates hurdles to traceability and gives opportunities or creates extra opportunities for cattle laundering, which implies added risks of non-compliance with the upcoming EU regulation. Uh, and in addition, and as again, uh, I already explained it for the case of the soy supply uh, chains, the registries uh, used, the declarations used in this case from the Rural Environmental Registry and the Animal Transit Guides have some limitations uh, that may negatively affect traceability, contributing again to further risks of non-compliance uh, respect really related to uh, non-compliance with traceability. Next slide, please. Um, now, regarding issues that may emerge as a consequence of the due diligence requirements, including uh, traceability, um, such a, th these are, uh, in this case, leakage, uh, segregation, and exclusion of small operators and producers. So starting with market leakage, which basically implies that there is a bifurcation of clean and dirty supply streams, and products are diverted to other markets with laxer requirements. It is then a possibility that leakage may occur as an unintended consequence of this regulation, uh, especially considering that there are important markets, such as the Chinese and the domestic markets, uh, which currently do not require the same traceability standards as the EU will uh, upon the entering into force of this regulation. Um, but in any case, it is also important to take into account that the EU is a key export market, which can provide a strong incentive to the implementation of traceability in soy and cattle supply chains as a, a sort of a default feature which is independent of the, dis the destination market of, of the products. Also, it adds to the incentives the fact that the largest traders in Brazilian beef and soy, and which also export to markets other than the EU, are strengthening their deforestation-free commitments and improving their, their traceability systems, leaving then less wiggle room uh, for leakage. Uh, in the case of market segregation, uh, it is important to start by saying that segregation is not required per se by the regulation. What must be ensured is that the origin of the products is known when they're mixed and traded in bulk, which happens, for example, in the case of soy. However, if setting up segregated supply chains becomes uh, a necessity in practice, it would indeed prob, uh, apply, imply burdensome administrative and financial costs for, for, for operators and possibly also higher costs for EU consumers, um, which are also connected to some possible shortages of commodities uh, in the EU market derived from, from this. Um, in any case as well, uh, segregation can be avoided, again, if traceability requirements are implemented for the entire sourcing volumes, regardless of destination markets. This is more cost effective for a long term perspective, since costs associated with segregation are skipped altogether and costs with implementation of traceability are likely to become negligible uh, over time. Lastly, uh, regarding uh, the exclusion of small operators first, it is true that traceability may be challenging for, for small and medium-sized operators due to lack of familiarity with traceability systems and methods and their associated costs, which become uh, more burdensome or, or, or can be considered more burdensome in the case of small-scale operations. However, it is important to consider that there, there have been improvements in terms of the availability of data and systems and tools used for traceability, uh, and these have allowed uh, for a decline in the costs involved. 
And in addition, large traders in both the soy and cattle sectors have also pledged to assist smaller operators and, and partners in implementing traceability and monitoring systems as a means to contribute to a more uh, transparent and sustainable sector. As for the small producers, uh, we must say that in the, in the case of Brazilian soy and, and the soy supply chains, uh, small producers are not uh, a key group in this, uh, in this sector uh, because it's mostly soy production uh, in Brazil is mostly in the hands of, of larger producers. Uh, and in the case of cattle production, uh, small producers play a more important role, and it is therefore important to incentivize them and facilitate their adherence to traceability systems. And for that, we already see some meat packers and retailers starting to introduce vertical integration schemes where they offer long-term contracts and technical assistance to small producers. So just uh, to conclude here, if, if there is will, there are good opportunities and ways of avoiding the exclusion uh, of these groups, uh, as well as market leakage uh, and segregation. Next slide, please. In what concerns non-compliance, breaching the traceability requirements of the regulation carries uh, legal and reputational risks. So the legal risks exist because the due diligence requirements, which include once again the traceability part, uh, will be enforceable by law. So these risks fall uh, upon operators and traders that place products in the EU market as they are the actors responsible for making sure that the due diligence requirements are met there will uh, be annual checks in, a, in an annual plan of checks performed by uh, and produced by the competent authorities in the EU member states. And they will cover a yet to be determined percentage of operators and total quantity of the products included in the regulation uh, upon which they will assess uh, if there are breaches. And in the case those are found, um, those operators and traders or those found to be in breach will be subjected to penalties. As for the reputational risks, uh, these are also at stake, particularly because the public image of those found to be in breach uh, of the traceability requirements or those that are directly or indirectly connected uh, to those that violate uh, this requirement may be uh, negatively affected. Um, there is also a reputational risk. Uh, it might also uh, become associated with sourcing from countries benchmarked as high risk, since these countries may be linked to higher chances of non-compliance with the regulation. So the question remains here uh, whether this might lead in return also to a preference for products sourced from low-risk countries and what might be the consequences for countries benchmarked as high risk and the supply chains uh, that uh, originate from, uh, from such countries. So this is it from my side. I will now hand it over to Sarah. Hi, everyone. So I'm Sarah of Aid Environment. So I will give a more uh, concrete play out of the EU deforestation regulation on the three largest Brazilian meat packers, JBS, Marfrig and Minerva. Next slide, please. So we have stated in our report that came out, I think yesterday or today, that these three meat packers, they will be impacted by this EU deforestation law. Uh, and as Rita already explained, uh, the EU mainly imports frozen beef and leather products from a high deforestation risk country, Brazil. Um, so we also know that these three meat packers, they dominate the Brazilian cattle industry, and they are all three uh, large exporters to the EU. So if you look at the table on the bottom uh, left, you can see that JBS, Minerva and Marfrig are the top three largest exporters of frozen beef to the EU. And if we look at the table on the right, we can see that uh, the three JBS, Minerva and Marfrig, they are also among the top 10 Brazilian exporters of uh, tent or wet blue hides and skins to the EU. 
So since uh, leather and uh, beef products will be under the scope of this EU deforestation law, the, the three meat packages, they will also need to comply uh, with this law. Next slide, please. So what we see here in the in the images is uh, the locations of the of the production hotspots of uh, of direct and indirect suppliers of the three meat packers. So this is based on a, on a sample that we have created uh, of direct suppliers that are in the left column and indirect suppliers that are on the right column. Um, this is very relevant to know the exact locations of the of the production. Uh, this will be very relevant under the EU deforestation law that has this uh, traceability requirement. So, if we look at the images on the left, uh, uh, on the bottom, on the top left in red is the direct suppliers to uh, to JBS, uh, and and on the top right it's the indirect suppliers to JBS. Minerva is represented by the yellow heat maps and uh, Marfrik is represented by the blue heat maps. So basically, uh, the, the brighter the, colon, the colors, the, the more concentration of, uh, of suppliers. So this was uh, based on a sample, as I said. Uh, and for the methodology of the sample, I, uh, I refer to the, the report as well, or you could also uh, ask more questions about that in the Q&A. But just very briefly, how we created this sample was by um, combining data on, uh, on um, the slaughterhouse locations, and we combined it with, uh, with data on rural cadastre data. And we also combined it with uh, cattle flows from uh, cattle farms to the slaughter slaughterhouses of the three meat packers. And this is by so-called animal um, animal transportation permits or the so-called GTA data. Um, and combining all these data allowed us to know where the, the cattle is, uh, is being uh, transported from the farms to the slaughterhouses of the three meat packers. So it's a sample, which means uh, it's only part of the, the supplier base of the three uh, meat packers. So based on what the meat packers report on how many direct and indirect suppliers they have, for in, we could know that, for instance, uh, our sample covers about 13% of, uh, of JBS direct supplier base, 47% of Minerva, and 21% of Marfrik. So the, the meatpackers have seen this report uh, before publication, and they did not confirm, neither deny uh, these numbers. So based on these uh, heat maps that we created, uh, we could make some nice uh, findings or conclusions on what are the exact uh, buying zones of the, of the three meat packers. So we saw that uh, JBS is actually the, the dominant buyer in all the seven Brazilian states that we have included in the sample. And these seven Brazilian states are the, the largest cattle producing states. So we could also see that Minerva, so again, they are in yellow or Marfrik in blue, that, uh, that they have a buying zone that is concentrated in fewer states. For instance, if we look at uh, Marfrik in blue, you can see that in their direct and indirect supplier base, there's uh, hardly any suppliers in Tocantins, for instance. I do not have uh, control over the cursor now, but maybe uh, Matt, you can show where Tocantins is. Um, and also, uh, at the same time, we can see that um, in Para, also Marfrik has, a, has not a big uh, supplier base, a few indirect suppliers. And at the same time, Marfrik in blue, they have a, a large uh, supplier base in Mato Grosso do Sul, which is a, a state on the bottom. So another conclusion we could draw from this is that uh, the indirect supplier base for all the three meat packers is uh, nearly double, doubled for all the three meat packers in, in Para state. So Para state is completely uh, on the top. And this is very relevant because this is, a, this is an Amazon state. And also we know there's a, a high risk for deforestation in the state. And also we know that uh, these three meat packers, they do not yet monitor all their indirect supply. So this is yeah, very relevant for a state such as uh, Para. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we could also uh, derive other patterns from uh, from our sample. It's also good to know that we managed to have uh, insights on the production hotspots till the level of municipalities and till the level of farms. But that would be too detailed to uh, to share here in the webinar, but you can uh, read about that also in the report. But one of these patterns that we saw based on the sample is that uh, if we look at the direct suppliers, we could see that direct suppliers, nearly 80% supply only one of the three meat packers, whereas only 2% supplies all three meat packers at once. Well, if we look at the pie chart of the indirect suppliers on the right, you can see that most indirect suppliers, they supply two meat packers or even more, 10% supplies three meat packers. So we have plotted the locations of these uh, indirect and direct suppliers that uh, that provide cattle to all three meat packers at once on the right side. Next slide, please. So what we also did is to overlay this, uh, this data set with uh, deforestation and fire alert data. And that resulted uh, that we that we found considerable uh, conversion in the sample since the 2020 uh, cutoff date of the EU deforestation regulation. So this date is currently 31st of December 2020, uh, but this is still under debate. But we calculated all deforestation in the sample since this date, uh, and that showed that nearly yeah that over 65,000 hectares of uh, Amazon vegetation was cleared after this period and more than 6,000 hectares of Cerrado vegetation was cleared. Uh, and this would be non-compliant with the uh, EU deforestation law. So we actually had more deforestation alerts in the Cerrado, but we only considered uh, woodlands because under the current proposal, woodlands was included as an ecosystem in the, in the regulation, but this is also still under debate. So we didn't uh, include, for instance, Cerrado grasslands vegetation. Also uh, very relevant to, to realize is that this is uh, both legal and illegal deforestation. Uh, and it also, we do not make any claims on illegality uh, for these three meat packers, because in theory, it could be that all the deforestation that we found would be compliant, for instance, under Brazilian law. So as Rita already explained, under Brazilian law, uh, farmers can still uh, clear a large part of their farms, especially in the Cerrado. But under this upcoming EU deforestation law, both will become non-compliant. And this is really an essential point of, uh, of our report and this webinar. Uh, also, a very key conclusion that we could make was that deforestation that is linked to the indirect suppliers of these three meat packers is much more significant. So it was found to be four times larger. Uh, if you look at the right column in the table, you can see that 65,712 hectares was deforested in the indirect supplier base of the sample co uh, compared to 15,470 thousand hectares in the direct supplier base in the sample. And final conclusion is that we saw that uh, Amazon uh, producers in the sample, they have cleared much more uh, hectares compared to the Cerrado uh, producers. Uh, and this is actually also in line with, uh, with what we seen, have seen since 2019, since the, the Bolsonaro inauguration that the Amazon deforestation and fires are very much uh, on the rise. Next slide, please. So what is very relevant to understand is that since these three meat packs, they do not monitor all the indirect supply. And we have also seen from, from the presentation that this is actually connected to most of the deforestation. None of them can guarantee compliance with this upcoming EU deforestation law. Uh, and also the deadlines for full supply chain transparency by these meat packers are very much out of pace with the expected law implementation from next year. So we know that Marfreak has committed to zero deforestation in 2025 in the Amazon and in 2030 in the Cerrado. Uh, but Marfri Minerva for 2030 
but JBS has only committed to zero deforestation by 2035. So you can see that this is really out of pace with the uh, EU deadlines. Uh, also, JBS and Minerva, they only monitor illegal deforestation linked to their suppliers. Uh, and as I showed, uh, and also Rita said, the EU law will also consider this Brazilian legal deforestation as non-compliant. So Marfrig is actually the only meat packer that commits to zero deforestation, and that also includes legal deforestation. So breaching this uh, upcoming law will imply legal risks for the three meat packers in the form of prosecution or penalties. And it will also involve uh, reputational risks for either meat packers, leather operators, and especially for downstream fast moving consumer good companies, because they are often the target of, uh, of NGO campaigns. So we already saw some campaigns in the, in the near past for instance, on uh, European supermarkets that uh, were connected to, um, to JBS uh, meat that was linked to deforestation. And also uh, there are reports on the automotive industry that uses uh, leather for their seats. Um, and also we saw that uh, car manufacturers like Volkswagen or Renault, they were found to be uh, connected with, uh, with the tanneries of JBS and Marfrig. Uh, and they were of Minerva, and they were linked also to uh, to deforestation. So I now hand over to uh, Gerard, who will discuss uh, finance and uh, finance implications. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, here's Gerard from uh, from Profundo, and um, um, the contributions of uh, Rita and uh, Sarah. They refer to two reports. And each report um, had a financial risk analysis. And uh, I like to present, uh, um, next slide, please. Uh, I like to present uh, uh, a selection of the outcomes for three categories, um, in, uh, in, uh, which were mentioned by Rita and by Sara, um, and that are the European, uh, uh, the European companies in beef, leather, and the soy supply chains. Um, they face the compliance costs um, and um, they might also face a reputation risk. And what we like to do now is what is the material, how material are those risks in financial terms and how material are those compliance costs um, uh, in financial terms for these companies. Also for the meat packers, we do exactly the, uh, we, do, we do exactly the same. And for the financing sector, um, also, next slide, please. Um, compliance costs, how large are these? Well, we have uh, um, these compliance costs, they might weigh heavily on importers and, and, and operators. Um, and um, um, this, while the value of the whole uh, European supply chain downstream is much larger, and that is important. This, uh, the, the table that you see here is an important input to see uh, to, 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 to understand how shared responsibility can work because a lot of value in the uh, supply chain is generated downstream. As you can see uh, for soybean meal, uh, in the, 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 the value is, uh, is, is, is going threefold. So it's, it's moving up by 202% from 100 to 302. And for beef, it moves up from 100 to 164. So that's an, uh, 64%. So just this price elevation is essential to understand how the compliance costs, uh, which might weigh heavily on the imports and operators, but there is a shared responsibility for uh, the whole uh, uh, supply chain. Um, Next slide, please. Um, the compliance costs as percentage of the European Union import value. Here we have uh, 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 the an important benchmark. Here is the um, um, is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the 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 compliance costs in uh, in Palmo, and these are. Um, these are already very well 
uh, documented and there is a best in class. Uh, for instance, Unilever has a best in class in palm oil of around 65 euros per, per ton. And because of the, the fact that Rita clearly said that there is already uh, traceability systems already lastly present in, uh, in soy and beef, we take the an, an 30 benchmark for all for the beef, for the leather and for the soy. Of course, there can be economies of scale in particular for soy, but as can be seen later on, um, um, this, gives, this, this gives a good impression how large the financial risks are. And if you look to the total uh, auditing due diligence and verification costs, which will be crucial in this chain, uh, and you see the millions in, in 7 million, 14 million, and 951 million, that is around 0.4%, uh, 1% respectively, 7% uh, of the imported uh, imported value. Um, next slide, please. Um, however, of course, um, um, we just saw the, 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 the numbers versus the imported value. However, you must take a look at, uh, at uh, how the um, compliance costs are, uh, uh, which percentage is this, versus the profits in the whole supply chain. And this is where we apply the price elevation, which we have seen before in, in the table before. And here you can see the pricing up in the food chain for the beef products of 64% and for the soy products of 302%. And here you can see that further downstream, if you look to the compliance cost only on the embedded soy and the embedded beef, so not the full product, not the full uh, chicken, for instance, in the downstream or the dairy in the downstream, but just on the, on the piece of the embedded soy and the embedded beef, then these compliance costs in the full supply chains can be calculated at around 0.6 to 3.4% of the, um, of the uh, uh, gross profit and 2.8 and 13.5% on the operating profit. So this is not on the full profit of a company, it's only on the profit generated on the embedded soy and the em embedded beef in that European um, supply chain. Next slide, please. Um, however, of course, these companies, they make, they, 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 they make much more profit. They, make, they generate a full global operating profit. So this picture, this, this table shows you the, um, uh, the so not the embedded uh, soy, but the, uh, the, 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 the compliance cost against the full global operating profit. And that's what you can see in the last column. Um, that the compliance costs, which are set at that 30 US dollars per ton for each group. This is a selection of companies which use a lot of soy or a lot of beef. And you can see that McDonald's, for instance, is in both uh, categories, as well as in soy, as well as in, in, uh, in beef. And if you then calculate that number in the um, of, com of compliance cost as percentage of global operating profit, then this is a very low percentage. As you can see, it's 0% to 0.5%. Uh, um, um, of the global profits. Next slide, please. Um, reputation risk, we just talked about the, comp the, the, the compliance cost, which right, materially they are very low. Uh, but now it's important to know, okay, but how much profits do they make on this embedded uh, soy, soy, embedded beef, and embedded uh, um, uh, uh, leather? Because um, uh, then we can co compare that with, with the compliance cost. And then if you look to the, uh, to the, uh, to, 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 to the profit exposure of uh, fast-moving consumer good industry uh, in, in beef, that is only 
zero to six point four percent for a selection of companies. That's all based on that price elevation. You can read more in in the report for letter uh, letter in the whole value chain of the European uh, industry. It is around zero point uh, zero point zero seven percent. So less than 0.1% of the e e European automotive. Sector. So it's very tiny. Uh, and also for the shoe sector, where also a lot of leather is used, it's around, it's a bit, bit more, it's 1.3%. Um, soy, if you look to the, how much profits is made on the embedded soy in uh, Latin American uh, based uh, embedded soy in the fast moving consumer sector, it's also 0.5 to 7. 0.5 to 7.3 percent low percentage accumulated in one company of course when they use beef and soy then the dependence on uh, embedded soy or embedded beef uh, and embedded leather from latin america that can be double digit and this is a very good proxy for the size of the of, of the reputation risk we have uh, methodologies for this and let's say that is around one third of these percentages that you just see. So in total, the reputation risk for these companies is relatively uh, minor. Next slide, please. Uh, then now we turn to the to the second group, JBS, Marfit, and Minerva. Um, you just already saw that uh, the 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 the, 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 ton, the tons of uh, of exposure. If you go to the value. You can see that the Latin America exports to, to the European Union, they are relatively low for these companies. It's 2% uh, for JBS and Minerva has the highest, it's 5.3%. You can see that at the yellow arrow. If you look to the blue arrow, we have calculated the value for, for, for these companies, for, of these exports to, these, uh, uh, to, 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 to the European Union. And then these, uh, this can be, quite material by the way it's it's 10 to 90 percent it is mainly because that of the fact that the market value of these companies are a relatively low percentage of the enterprise value you can see that as percents of the enterprise value the percents are much lower of the of for, for these companies so if this export to the european union would fall away um uh, would it have a consequence for the for the reputation value of these companies? I have my doubts about it. Uh, the the current valuation of the companies you can see that in the uh, in the green uh, arrow is relatively low. The enterprise value EBITDA is around three to five, and that is a very low valuation for uh, for, for 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 consumer stocks for uh, food stocks, and that means that. Uh, there is already quite some skepticism in the future, uh, in the sustainability of the future cash flow streams of the current meat profits for JBS, Marfrit, and uh, and um, and Minerva. Next slide, please. Um, meat packers financing is also very dependent on the uh, on on the European Union, and that is important to understand because of the financial institution around fifteen percent come from uh, of identified financing comes from the European Union uh, European Union financial institutions and of course when they go away that leads to financing risk and to um, uh, and, and potentially to higher interest rates for these companies um, however for the uh, for the for the financial institutions in the European Union the exposure to these three companies is very low and it is uh, uh, the 2.4 billion, as you can see, is uh, is a tiny fraction of the of the 27 trillion of total assets, shares, and bonds in the European financial institution. Nevertheless, European finances will face reputation risk, uh, and uh, but because of this 15 percent uh, uh, of, the, of of dependence for for for, for the meatpackers. There is really leverage to engage for the financial institutions. Next slide, please. Um, however, the uh, the European financial sector they are not directly affected. That they are not in through the European deforestation regulation proposal. They are just not included. In fact, and there are a lot of critical 
uh, remarks about it. Um, um, indirectly, of course, the finances might face financial risk in the shareholders' bonds and loans. That is uh, that is clearly uh, true, uh, and um, then uh, of course they receive dividends, interest, income, etc. But again, uh, JBS, Marfrig, and Minerva is less than 0.1 percent of the total assets. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, this, these are the conclusions. I will keep it short because of time reasons. Um, in fact, for if we look to the three groups, uh, the European uh, companies in the chain, if you look to the, um, the, the meat packers, and if you look to the finances, then in fact, yeah, most of the problems are for the, most of the financial risk, the most material financial risk are for the, for the meat packers. They might face uh, the, the revenue decline, they might face the, and uh, let's say a value risk, DCF-based value is quite substantial versus the current market cap, although we think that a relatively big part is already discounted by market participants, by investors, because of the very low valuation of these, uh, of these companies. So with this, I like to uh, uh, hand back to Matt. Thank you, Gerard, and thanks to all the presenters today. That was really great. And we now have some time for Q&A. So we'll kick that off. If anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q&A uh, function, and we hope to uh, get to them before time runs out. So first question for Rita. Uh, why will the cost of traceability systems be relatively small over time? Is this because the initial investments is the biggest hurdle, and then they are low cost to run? Um, could you uh, please talk to that? Uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for the question, Sam. Uh, so actually, um, the thing is, the experience that we have and like the knowledge that we have nowadays uh, from uh, existing supply chains traceability initiatives uh, indicates that these implementation costs associated uh, with traceability, when they are done at scale, they become gradually uh, negligible compared to the financial flows linked to the so so soft commodity uh, trade. And what I mean by this is, for example, if we get the, the example of uh, the Amazon uh, soy moratorium, uh, which covers approximately 90% of the relevant soy markets coming from there, and the costs of implementing the monitoring, si the monitoring system after the transition period, they became negligible compared to the revenue that then flew to the participants in this uh, agreement. So that's why we claim that indeed over time, these, uh, these traceability costs can become negligible and they, uh, they, they, they can become something that is uh, manageable by those uh, involved in these uh, investments. Great, thank you very much, Rita. Um, Question for uh, Sarah, um, could you talk about the magnitude of deforestation in Brazil in general and which commodities are mostly responsible? Yes, um, yeah, so in general, we know that uh, cattle production and also especially uh, leather production are, are the, the largest contributors to deforestation, more even than soy. So that is the very short answer. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So a question for Harard. Could you explain uh, pricing up and how it differs from different derivatives from and versus cost of processing, transport, and post-harvest losses? Um, yes. Um, well, the, 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 pri the pricing up is, uh, is, is, let's say, is, is, not, is not related to, uh, to, 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 to post harvest losses. The pricing up is in fact very, very, very simple. It's it, the, uh, the methodology that we use is the world market price, the, the, the import price within the European Union. And we add up the gross margin of every uh, level in the chain. So every level in the chain is increasing adding value. It's increasing the price of the embedded uh, soy to the um, to, to the 
uh, feed manufacturer, feed manufacturer to the farmer, the farmer to the uh, dairy company, and the dairy company to the uh, uh, to the to the retailer. And this is the this the, this is the, uh, the the methodology that we that we use. And uh, this is very important to understand how the value, the monetary value in the chain, is uh, is is generated mainly in the downstream sector. For palm oil, we did this calculation, and that's where we saw that the fast-moving consumer goods and the uh, retailers they generated around 66 percent of the gross profits in the whole palm oil uh, chain. And for uh, we did the same work for 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 sugarcane, um, and um, and uh, uh, so this the, for for soy we did we did some work on this. And the downstream sector is the is the real uh, generator, and there will be losses there. That's true, but um, uh, the profits are on embedded soy, embedded beef, and embedded uh, leather are really made in the um, in the downstream sector. Great, thanks, Gerard. A question now for Sarah: Do you think that the EU regulation will have a real impact on the ground in Brazil? and actually change the commitments and behaviors of corporates? Or is there a danger that the companies simply sw switch markets and just sell elsewhere? Yes, thank you for that excellent question. Uh, yeah, I think that leakage is definitely a real risk, uh, especially, well, now we focus on uh, on soy and beef, but for instance, in palm oil, we know that, uh, that there's also the Indonesian domestic market that has less environmental restrictions. So there's a, really a risk of, uh, of of leakage there but at the same time like if we look at for instance cattle we know that for instance marfrey they are really a large exporter to the eu um and they i don't think they can really miss this market so uh yeah and i also think that marfrey is already taking uh, quite some steps to to be to become compliant with this EU regulation. So I think in general, the EU regulation will be very positive in the way that it can be like an accelerator of, uh, of commitments. Great, thanks, Sarah. So uh, back to Harard, um, could you talk about how the leverage of banks and investors differs from that, that um, the leverage that traders have? Sorry, then, but the, the the leverage of banks and investors, how does it differ from traders in terms of engagement with companies? Yeah, um, traders traders well, traders can, can be quite close to the uh, to the to the to, to, to the producers of the of the product. They can have a significant uh, market share. It's like a bottleneck, um, and their leverage can be quite substantial in um, uh, towards uh, towards the uh, producers also because the fast moving consumer good industry is um, is under pressure to uh, offer to its clients uh, clean and, um, and and products with a high level of traceability and these fast moving consumer good companies they are again under pressure from civil society to do this um, banks uh, yeah, they are sometimes still still behind, yeah, and um, there is still a lot of a uh, lot of work to do. And as we can see in this European Union def def deforestation regulation, they are left out. Um, they have leverage, uh, although also here the the problem we just heard the, the word leakage. Also heard here the the the, the leakage can occur that the European Union financial institution, if they divest or engage too seriously that the uh that that jbs uh and and that kind of companies might move to the uh to to the asian banks and uh, financial institutions for financing and that has already happened in the last 10 years so the exposure of the european union finance has declined the hope is of course that uh, the uh, financial institutions in the united states as well as in Asia, and you see it gradually happening, that the um, that the uh, that they will take that they also will do uh, that, that they will do this exactly the same 
uh, or that they get the same requirements as the European Union financial institutions will, will have. Great, thanks for that explanation, Gerard. Question for Rita, um, could you expand your point on segregation? Um, the, the questioner asks is that their understanding is that there can be no mixing of deforestation free volumes with volumes linked to deforestation and of unknown origin. Yeah, of course. Uh, and thank you, Leticia, for, for the question. And I'm so sorry if uh, I wasn't clear on their part. So I'm going to indeed try to make it more clear now. Uh, what I meant was that uh, what the regulation uh, does not require is that there is a ban on products of mixed origin. What I mean is, for example, you may have soy that comes from the Amazon and soy that comes from the Cerrado. And these batches can be mixed and be imported into the EU market, right? What must be there is that their actual origin that is known. So indeed what you say, it's true. It needs the origin must be known for both batches, even though they're mixed. So there's no problem with the mixing. What there's a problem with is if we don't know where those batches that were mixed come from, right? And this was very much clarified by the Environment Commission uh, commissioner even, because there were uh, quite some doubts on, on that aspect. Uh, also, what you say in terms of the mass balance approach is true. It's not uh, acceptable in the EU regulation because of these conditions that are imposed on the um, on knowing the, the origin of the products. Uh, and I would like to add to that, that even following the OECD and the FAO, these mass balance models uh, that allow for the mixed batches uh, of grains are actually uh, or should not be acceptable uh, under zero deforestation target. So thank you for, for, for your question, Leticia. Thanks, Rita. Now a question back to uh, Sarah. Uh, regarding the EU law, should we consider only the direct importation uh, from Brazil, or should we also consider that leather from Brazil can be exported to a country where it will then be manufactured and sent to Europe? Because in the second case, can it still be related to uh, deforestation? And would it be under the EU law as well? Yes, this is a very good question. And also I know that uh, several organizations are, are also considering this question. So uh, in SEC under the EU deforestation regulation, they only look at the operators. So that are uh, those uh, companies that first place the, the product in the EU market. So if we look, for instance, at leather products, it's mainly raw hides and skin uh, and wet blue uh, leather that had, that is exported from Brazil to mainly Italy. Um, so in that sense, then uh, Italy would be uh, the first market where the product is placed. But then, of course, indeed, there's a lot of manufacturing within Europe. So it's also very important to uh, to follow basically uh, where the products are, are going after they uh, enter in the European market. Uh, but this will not necessarily be covered under the EU deforestation regulation. But this is also important, for instance, because we know that the majority of, uh, of Brazilian soy is going to China. So it's also very relevant to wonder uh, what is happening in those countries that mainly process uh, products. We know for, for instance also that a lot of tires, if we look at uh, rubber production are, are manufactured in Czech Republic or so indeed, yeah, this is very relevant. It is, it is not as such covered under the EU deforestation regulation, but I know that also our organization is, is working on, uh, on following the, the flows of the commodities within Europe. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. A follow-up question to that is, um, how do you see uh, this EU regulation possibly pushing um, other importers, perhaps China, uh, to crack down on um, uh, beef from Brazil that's connected to deforestation. So maybe uh, Rita can also support me on this question, but I know that other countries are also developing their own uh, regulations. So I don't know exactly, but Rita, you talked about this lately. What is this? China is developing a deforestation-free law, right? 
Yeah, they are starting to work on uh, uh, the deforestation that is embedded in their own supply chains. So what we see is basically that we have a, a global trend and a growing momentum in what comes to tackle deforestation that is embedded in uh, commodity imports and exports. Uh, so uh, the fact that we already have players uh, and big players uh, be them the importer countries or blocks or the traders that are already working towards cleaning their supply chains and, and uh, investing in traceability systems and in monitoring and etc. This uh, this implies that this momentum is, is, is coming a bit for all, so to speak. So there are fewer and fewer options for for countries to also avoid doing their due diligence obligations and uh, and we're sort of like jumping on the the bandwagon here. Great, thanks Rita. So um we've gone past the hour but we'll um take the time to ask uh I'm sorry to answer a couple more questions. Um so one question is where is the greatest opportunity and risk for supporting small meat packers to comply? Are there any examples of successful sustainability linked loans for um, boosting traceability? Uh, shall I answer that question, Matt? Yep, go for it, Harar. Harar yep. um, there are sustainability linked loans. That's right. Um, however, um, um, as uh, they are ESG related often and or sustainalytics related. And um, the incentive is not dramatically uh, large in these uh, sustainability loans. So um, there are doubts about the, uh, the effectiveness of, uh, of, uh, of uh, ESG loans. I don't know whether this answers the question. Okay, thank you for that, Harard. Take a um, couple more. You can always, by the way, after this uh, webinar, also send us emails to our addresses and we can uh, still reply to your questions. And if you would like a copy of the presentation, we'd be happy to, um, to share that with you. So uh, what has the Brazilian government um, done to improve reliability of current self-reported traceability systems and or improve national laws connected to legal and illegal deforestation? Well, I think the answer is that there was not much in the last uh, years, but uh, personally, I hope that with the new, uh, new government, it will uh, become better. Yeah, uh, just to add to this, uh, like what I, I mentioned during my presentation, indeed, we see that there are some um, limitations, inherent limitations to uh, the systems and data that can be used and that uh, will be important to be used in, in traceability. And some of those limitations really lie uh, with uh, governmental action. So there could be a lot of improvement if there was uh, some uh, some governmental uh, action towards uh, improving these systems and and uh, sort of addressing the flaws that as already it has already been uh, indicated that are there uh, and that should be be tackled. So uh, indeed, if the upcoming uh, government could uh, address uh, sort of these loopholes, that would already uh, in, it, that would already bring some uh, some some improvement and contribute uh, to uh, better traceability of these products in Brazil. Great, thank you for that, Rita and. Thanks for all the panelists today. Um, we're now out of time. If we did not get to your um, question, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of us and we'll, um, we'll reply as soon as we can. And also, again, if you'd like a copy of the presentation, we'd be happy to send that to you. So uh, thanks again, everyone. And um, we hope to see you at another event relatively soon.